Advancing environmental sustainability in bioprocessing is an important and necessary step in achieving our industry's aim of improving global health. And by partnering with biopharma and CDMOs, suppliers play a vital role in developing innovative ways to support their customers' sustainability goals. I'm Miles Skoda, and this is the Life Science Connect webinar series, and today we're talking environmental sustainability in bioprocessing. Now, joining me for this presentation are two industry experts from Thermo Fisher Scientific, Adam Goldstein, Senior Director for Bioprocess Sciences, and Moretta Miles, Senior Director for Environmental Sustainability, who are going to discuss sustainability in bioprocessing and the exciting advancements happening in the space, including practical examples and case studies. Now, we'll be holding a Q&A session following this presentation. Feel free to submit questions as we go along. We'll get to as many as possible during the Q&A, and any that we don't get to will follow up on after the event. And then just a bit of housekeeping. If you run into any issues today, please try refreshing your browser first. If your problem persists, submit a question via the Q&A, and I'll help get you back on track. And then finally, this webinar will be available on demand, usually within a day or two, and you'll get an email with a link to it, or you can just use the same link that you used today. So with all that said, I'm going to turn it over to our experts to get started. Hello, my name is Maretta Miles, and I lead environmental sustainability here at Thermo Fisher. I'm one of the leaders driving our environmental sustainability program and working both internally to do so, closely with our customers to deliver on their goal, and engaging in with several organizations to drive our sustainability program forward for the industry. Um, Adam and I are both excited to be here today with you to share uh, some of the things that we're doing within sustainability, both internally to Thermo Fisher and externally. So, Adam, over to you. Great. So, I'm definitely excited. So, I'm the director of R&D collaborations. My role here is is a different but fun one. Uh, I've worked for years within the industry, such as Biogen, Amgen, and Genentech. Um, and in those roles as a high end user, I really incorporated single use technology into existing stainless steel plants to make them more efficient. In recent years after joining Thermo Fisher, I took this role on to, to really demonstrate the capabilities of our technologies as we launch them out of research and development and then employ them in both internally to our pharma services group, CDMO, as well as expand them into existing uh, and new customer base. Uh, so, in developing these technologies, uh, and if you've seen some of my publications or talks in the past, I'm very passionate about single use technologies. Uh, so, I feel very strongly um, empowered to also do something about how we employ those single use technologies when we use them in the plant, how to be a better steward of the environment uh, when we use them and how to drive sustainability through the execution of these technologies. So hopefully today you'll get some of that excitement of our new technologies and our capabilities here at Thermo Fisher to help you drive some of those sustainable actions. Thanks, Adam. I will start out by taking us through a corporate perspective of environmental sustainability, and then we'll get back to Adam to talk more about how our products um, can help you in this space. So from a corporate perspective and the world that we live in, the science of global climate and environmental crisis is clear. You'll see listed on the slide a number of areas um, that our customers are working to solve problems in. We know you are on the front lines of developing these solutions, and what we want to cover today are some ways that we can help you drive those solutions um, as your partner. So moving on to our approach to environmental sustainability, how do we think about it? Well, we have really three focus areas when we think about this. Like many of you, we have ambitious goals in net zero, water, and waste. And I'll discuss those more specifically in the coming slide. Design for sustainability is becoming more and more important to us, and we're committed to designing products with the environment in mind. And I'll highlight some of the areas where we're working there as well. And then working in partnership, we can't do this alone. And we are constantly being pulled into conversations with our customers, how we can help our customers. 
We um, work in our communities. We work internally across Thermo Fisher. We're a big company. And also we collaborate in industry associations. And I'll highlight some of those collaborations today as we're speaking together. Let's take a closer look at our external targets. We have made substantial steps to act on our commitments. For scope one and two, we want to reduce our emissions by 50% by 2030 and help our suppliers reduce their emissions, all to achieve net zero by 2050. This is important to our company mission to enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer, and our commitments to our customers. We know that we are your scope three. The way we think about reducing our footprint and our environmental impact is not only to reduce our own emissions, but also preserve resources and manage waste. With that, we've also established a water goal centered around reducing our usage, focusing first on the water scarce areas of the world and looking at our water intensive operations there. And then for waste, we also want to reduce the amount of waste that we produce overall, but uh, also equally important, reducing the waste that we send to landfill and incineration. And instead, increasing the amount that's reused, recycled, and really contributing to the circular economy. So we've set a goal to have 30 of our sites zero waste certified by 2025. I'm happy to report that our external targets are now validated by the science-based targets initiatives. This goes for our emissions targets, our climate targets. The science-based target initiative is the gold standard for companies that make climate pledges. And we are inspired by our progress, not only towards our own goals, but also helping our customers achieve their sustainability goals. So what is our strategy around our own sites? Well, we're really working hard to move away from fossil fuel as a power source and instead switching to renewable electricity. And this is a big undertaking. We're a big company with operations all over the world. Currently, we have about 150 sites powered with 100% renewable electricity. And uh, we want to increase that number, so we're actively working in the different areas of the world to do that. Uh, it's not the same rules that apply everywhere, so we're working differently with local governments uh, to pursue options um, that will get us there. And then in the U.S., uh, of course, we have significant operations in the U.S. So in the U.S., we're really focusing on a couple of projects. Uh, we have a wind project that we're investing in in Oklahoma and a solar project in Texas. And these will create additional renewable energy sources, which is so important to create additional, not just investing in existing. And by 2026, all our US sites, all our current sites will be operating on 100% renewable electricity through these two projects. So by achieving these goals, we don't only help ourselves, but also our customers um, because we're part of your supply chain. Um, next area I wanted to highlight a little bit more was designing more sustainable products. We continue to elevate designing products to minimize their environmental impact. And we have our strategy is centered around five focused areas. And you can see that in the dark gray boxes on these slides. Today, I want to just highlight a couple of products starting with less waste, um, our Dynaspin single-use centrifuge. Uh, by using this product, you'll generate less filter liquid and chemical waste. And Adam, in a little bit here, will tell you us more about how um, that will play out at your um, site. And in terms of responsibly packaged, that's the other area I wanna highlight today, um, packaging, results in waste for our customers. So that's one of the reasons we focus on that. So less waste and responsibly packaged are important. It's also important for you to receive your product with the integrity 
maintained. So when we do focus on packaging pro um, programs, we want to create less packaging, maintain the integrity of the pro product. Uh, so this particular product ships with less, uh, 20, about 25% less packaging. That not only reduces uh, less waste at our customers, but it consumes less raw materials and also um, will result in a reduction of greenhouse gases as this is uh, transported, both the raw material and the product to the customer. So all over, a really important uh, to look at how we design our products um, with the environment in mind. Uh, moving on uh, to sustainability in bioprocessing. So from moving from the corporate view to the bioprocessing view. We understand the challenges you face in delivering the products that you are working on. Your operations are complex. There's cost um, concerns in investing in new technology. And then on top of that, you are delivering environmental sustainability goals and concerned about how are you going to meet those goals. So what we're presenting today, we hope to um, highlight to you ways that we can help you achieve your goals. We understand um, both for ourselves and for our customers how important a total life cycle management approach is, um, really driving circularity through the entire value chain. So how we um, design our products, how we source our raw materials, how we manufacture them at our uh, factories, how we deliver the products to our customers, and how we can dispose of them at end of life. These are all important areas of the life cycle to consider, and we're definitely starting to work on them, but they're big problems to solve, and I'm gonna talk about uh, that a little more detail in the next slide on how we're partnering and collaborating to drive solutions um, and impacting the product life cycle. Adam will then uh, drive a, a will focus on driving efficiencies in your processes today. Really look at what you can do today to improve sustainability at your sites. So first, let me focus on um, a little bit what we're doing in um, collaboration with some industry associations. And these associations all focuses in the uh, bioprocessing area. Uh, Bioforum, for example, they are really focused on um, new emerging technology in the industry and um, tackling these uh, challenges. So we are participating on their sustainability team as well as many of their other teams. But today I want to talk a little, little bit how we're uh, participating in their sustainability team. So uh, it started, uh, their sustainability team started only um, a couple of years ago, and the focus first was to create a uh, industry roadmap for sustainability. And uh, Thermo Fisher took a leadership role in creating that roadmap. Our name is listed as one of the authors, and I encourage you to check that out. Um, this roadmap focused on how do we decarbonize the industry, as well as how to create a circularity and design uh, de-risk innovation and really respond to a lot of the regulations we're seeing, especially out of Europe. Um, so this year, now that the roadmap is really well-defined, we're looking at what projects can we tackle to improve um, sustainability in the industry. And um, the roadmap is available for download. You can check it out and read more about it. And um, we'll point to that as in our resource section when we finish um, the webinar today. The other organization that we are partnering with is BPSA. They are focusing on really educating the industry on single-use technology, both used for development and manufacturing. Uh, sometimes single-use is um, the best uh, use, and uh, Adam will talk a little bit more through that. Um, there are several studies out there that shows um, single use is the better option uh, compared to traditional technologies, but there are also challenges around single use, and most of our customers really want our help with the challenges of all the waste that is generated 
um, by using single use. So looking at how we can design our product with the end of life in mind, uh, partnering with our customers to find recycling solutions, and really working as an industry to find those solutions um, has been key to our involvement in BPSA. And then last, I want to tra uh, transfer to Adam to talk about ISPE. We've been very involved uh, with that organization as well. So Adam, take it away. All right. Thanks, Moretta. So um, as you may know or may not know, ISPE has been around for a while. Um, I'm one of the founding fathers for their single use community of practice. Um, and in the ISPE, traditionally over the past kind of 15 years, we've been focused on integration, development of single use technology and associated guidelines, uh, baseline guides for the use of single use technology. Um, recently, over the last year or so, Thermo Fisher has really taken a lead position at ISPE. And in fact, we created a sub team and one of the members from Moretta's team, who I very much enjoy working with, Christina is a lead for the sub team for the ISPE with regards to uh, sustainability. And what we're doing on that sub team is really looking at alternative solutions uh, as you're using these technologies to really employ unmet solutions with regards to waste. So for example, they may be non-traditional. They could be uh, partnerships with recycling companies that are not what you normally would think about. So can to can, that's not necessarily what we're talking about. We're talking about non-traditional ones such as universities, ability to convert the plastic to new products, to use it as filler for roads or development of new type of lumbers that are longer lasting. It doesn't necessarily need to be circular to be sustainable. And so that's really what we're focusing on is looking for traditional partnerships and non-traditional partnerships to do something to change the pendulum. And so I'll add one more thing before we go to the next slide. It, it, it's really around those applications where you use single use technologies, where we know that they impact and they have a great impact on the facility, on the size, on their Wi-Fi generation, on how much air that you scrub within your GMP areas to remain in a closed system. So we understand there's been many publications for single use technologies that go through those uh, unit operations and where the savings are. Well, now we're, we're changing the pendulum just a little bit and looking at if you do get those efficiencies using single use technologies, what are you doing with the waste at the back door? So we'll explore some of those unit operations and technologies that allow you to intensify your process and better utilize waste within your unit operations. Okay, so let's talk now specifically about some of the levers that you can use personally within the industry to start uh, employing sustainability within your operations. So there's three main areas we're going to focus on today is really around deploying innovative equipment, how you use it, your supply chain optimization, and then refining processes. So using the next couple of slides that we're going to go through as case study examples, really want to highlight a couple of um, really truly innovative Good examples of how we believe you can deploy innovative new equipment to drive waste reductions, drive process intensification for your company internally, while doing it in a closed, connected processing manner. So what you can see here are examples of our most recent product launches. We're really highlighting the capabilities of our DynaDrive, which is our intensified bioreactors. And you can see here as an example, we're showing the scale up from 50 liters 500 liters and the capability to scale up the 5,000 liter, uh, which is driving intensification while driving sustainability. And I'll go over those in just a second. The other really um, needle movement changer for the industry is this new product that we just launched. And this enables you to really drive waste reduction while enhancing your process and reduce the physical dimensions of your facility by reducing the amount of waste and depth filtration that we'd normally employ during um, Chinese hamster ovary map production. So let me go over those for you now briefly. 
let's take the case study here for uh, our Dynadrive bioreactors shown here from 50 liters up to the 5,000 liter scale. Uh, using some of the case studies that we've employed uh, over the past year or so internally with real case studies uh, driving the implementation of this technology, we've shown that we've gotten up to 70% less packaging of plastic waste by employing uh, high density seed uh, expansion within our Dyna drives. That allows us to really drive away the uh, laborious spinner um, and wave and other type of expansion trains and really reduce your manufacturing steps um, and concentrate them within just the bioreactor storage cell reactor stage. This really results in less consumables per run, and as you can see, extrapolated here, roughly 70% at the 5K level. This also drives greater than 40% lower cost per gram when you're operating in this condition using this capital versus traditional stainless steel operations. And as you know, and I won't get into it in this discussion for the past 10 or so years or more, uh, industry has really captured uh, the benefits and merits of single-use technology versus stainless steel, specifically at scales at 5K and less. Let's take a look here at an example when we employ both of these new technologies uh, together and some of the strength that they can drive and lowering your operating cost and reducing um, waste out the back door for your plant. So shown in the top, you can see the traditional map process that the, the vast majority of map manufacturers employ. And you can see the small vial, the flask, the expansion, the rockers, and then the standard expansion through 50, 500, and 2K bioreactors. And the small blocks represent there the associated depth filtration trains. And in this case, shown here is not, um, not an example, is the actual um, values for these very large, these are very large depth filtration trains. Each one of those blocks represents 10 to 12 depth filters, uh, which can be purchased from a number of um, competing depth filter companies. They operate similarly. In the case shown below, what we're able to show is that we're able to knock out the vial, the flask, and the rocker expansion by employing uh, somewhere between 20 and 500 mil, depending on your your cell culture and your density that you're working with for your drug, go directly into the 500 mil Dynadrive through high density cell expansion, and then expand further into the 5K reactor. And what that does is really knock down a number of GMP steps, uh, saving roughly six to 10 manufacturing GMP days uh, for each of the tech transfer runs or each lot that you're running. Uh, that further intensifies your process reduces the number of steps that you have to move through and the associated quantity of depth filters that are required once you go to harvest. And, and that's shown here depictly here showing our Dyna spin versus traditional depth filters. It lets you roughly uh, reduce six to one the amount of depth filters that you employ. Of course, that depends on your viability, um, concentration, titer, et cetera, but we've looked anywhere from around four to seven fold reduction in depth filter employing this technology. So, so what? The so what is really all of these steps combined together dramatically reduce the amount of plastic and chemical waste, which I'll show you just now in the next slide. So if you take in this example, a traditional 2K and 5K run, and let's say that for a CMO or a MAD manufacturer, you're looking at roughly a volume of 10,000 liters for a production run. So you can do that through five by 2,000 liter reactors, or you can do it by two by 5,000 liter Dyna drives, for example. And that's, that's what's shown here. What we're saying is by scaling up into the 5K Dyna drive, employing the technologies I just reviewed with you, uh, you can see broken out by unit operation, the seed expansion, uh, seed expansion flasks, the bioprocess containers, the media bags, and the associated packaging units, meaning the cardboard, the bubble wrap, double wrapped camera um, bags that uh, cover your BPCs. You can see the associated reductions are dramatic when scaling up, uh, specifically using these intensified technologies from Thermo Fisher. 
that was the the Dynadrive, which I just showed to you, the uh, efficiencies in waste reduction using Dynadrive. Here, what I want to point out is really the intensification and reduction in depth filtration that this unit operation allows for us. So using this plug and play, extremely simple, very easy technology uh, using CPC connectors, it rolls into your purification or harvest suite, depending where you draw the line for harvest, and really reduces dramatically, as I said earlier, roughly sixfold the amount of depth filtration uh, that industry traditionally relies on. Uh, that's a 70% reduction in depth filters and roughly 25% savings in harvest uh, with regards to costs. And we have publications that we can make available to you to review that. Taking a look at how we gear those 70% reductions, you can see here shown the 5,000 liter scale um, shows the greatest reductions. And as you move down smaller in volume, then obviously your reductions are, are limited based on the efficiencies uh, at scale that you're losing. And to the right, we're breaking out again by production volume with the addition of Dynaspin versus depth filtration where those savings are shown. And as you can see, as you move up in volume, your um, savings in increases are dramatically saved. And I'll point that out in the next slide. So what really to this is this case study example here where we show a harvest, a typical harvest suite. As you can see in the top, you have the large banks and I hope that you can see here the what's representative of operators standing next to the depth filters. These depth filters are roughly six, seven feet high. Each of the filters is shown in the top. So we're showing the example here with a 5,000 liter Dynadrive bioreactor, has three associated depth filter pumps with five depth filter housings. Those depth filter housings roughly five to six feet high and have each filter is roughly the volume of what would be a standard snare drum. Um, those employ roughly 130 filters for a standard 5K run. And you can see that you're using roughly 14,000 liters worth of water for injection, buffers for setting up the filters and associated clean agents like sodium hydroxide. When you move to the Dynaspin units, you can see a dramatic drop from roughly 130 filters down to 40 filters and the associated WFI, buffer, and cleaning agents are dramatically dropped in this condition. And one last thing i like to point out. By employing these technologies, you'll see the space savings, where above you see the technicians and the associated space taken up by the harvest carts and the depth filtration holders, uh, roughly 40% savings in the sweet space. So that can be employed in a standard space you're using now and used for other unit operations. Or if you're uh, converting brown space or gray space and developing new manufacturing facilities, you could dramatically drop uh, that space uh, within your operating suites, saving on HVAC and movement and savings in capital as you scale up the building. So as you can see, there's, there's more benefits here than just the wet processing side of the process with regards to sustainability. And in the last example, the big take home here for the so what of those efficiencies, if we use the example here of just eight harvests, and if you're running a batch a week, uh, that's just two months. This is only looking at one unit operation, which is just the storage of the depth filters. Uh, in the top scenario with the depth filtration, it requires roughly 40 pallets within your warehouse of storage. When you use the single use centrifuge for the harvest, then you'll see that you drop roughly to 10 to 11 pallets uh, of depth filters, because you still need depth filters even with the centrifuge, but it's dramatically reduced. So um, we're quite proud of this as an example, and you can extrapolate the amount of savings over six to 12 months within the warehouse, and that's just for depth filters. So if you start taking into account the other unit, other unit operations and GPA savings space that I was going over earlier, uh, there's, there's a big opportunity to reduce space savings and energy within your facility by employing these process intensification steps. 
Thanks, Adam. Saving space is important to our customers. Next, I want to talk about optimizing supply chain and how that can also reduce carbon footprint. For example, transportation, it's a big source of emissions. And for most companies, including our customers, it's in the top categories of scope three emissions that they need to reduce. So with that, I wanna show you a case study from a customer on how they leveraged our manufacturing network to reduce their own emissions. This customer took advantage of in-region manufacturing for all the parts that they bought from us and this saved 1,300 metric tons of CO2 emissions annually. They achieved this by moving the products to be manufactured at a Thermo Fisher site closest to the point of use. So I encourage you to evaluate this option for your own products. Okay, and to wrap up, what's this mean? So I'm, I'm super excited. I've worked in the industry for many years development, operations, commercial manufacturing, process development. What this means is you can intensify your process while refining what your footprint really is for your operations and your plant. So we're here to help you. We're here to help intensify your process with these new technologies. We're glad to support you. Uh, we can come to the plant, do Gemba walkdowns of the site, look for those opportunities for you for both technology, process flow, standardization, and consumables, where it makes sense to really drive those expertise into your uh, MAP manufacturing process. So we have field application specialists that have been trained to support and optimize your process. Um, and we look forward to working with you um, on these exciting new technologies and environmental sustainability savings. Last, we want to leave you with some resources uh, if you want to learn more about what we've been talking about today. I uh, wanted to highlight that the uh, roadmap, the Bioforum Environmental Sustainability Roadmap that we uh, were authors of through the Bioforum is available for download. And you see uh, the Bioforum site listed here where you can download the roadmap. Encourage you to check that out, how you can decode carbonized in the industry, as well as uh, the focus uh, for achieving circularity. Uh, and then last thing we want to point out today is um, our resources internally to Thermo Fisher. So I want to start with the right hand side of the slide, uh, our greener products. You heard me talk about the five impact areas that we're focusing on in a couple of examples, um, one being the Dynaspin today, and you heard Adam talk about it as well. We have a fact sheet available on our website that'll back up all of our green claims. So uh, check that out. And then last, on the left-hand side of the slide here, our 2022 Corporate Social Responsibility Report. This was just released in May of this year. It's our best report ever. Uh, it has a lot more data than in previous year, really demonstrating the progress we're making to sustainability as well as um, our entire um, climate program and sustainability program. So check that out if you want to learn more. And with that, uh, that's all we have for you today. We uh, welcome any questions you may have as we go into the Q&A section. All right, and with that, Adam and Moretta, that was a great presentation, um, and we've got a lot of questions from the audience coming in. So audience members, please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, there should be a question box on your screen that I'm highlighting right now. It should be flashing, and you can ask your questions through that ask a question box, and we'll get through as many as possible here in the, the time that we do have. Um, and then just a couple of other reminders on your screen. You should be able to see our speaker's information as well, along with mine. If you do need to contact any of us, you can get in touch with us through that contact information, uh, and we'll get you connected to or answer whatever questions that you might need if you don't have time to ask them today. So with that, uh, let's get into questions from the audience. Our first one uh, asks, what does sustainability mean in the context of single use? Yeah, I can take that question, and it's a great one, right? Because uh, looking 
at sustainability really means looking at the big picture. So often we use single use, it kind of directs us to look at its use once and thrown away. But if you look at it with the bigger picture, using single use in bioprocessing can allow us to operate in a less clean environment, which saves energy. It avoids cleaning a lot of equipment, uh, reduces water significantly, chemicals significantly. And as Adam um, talked about using space, less space to condition overall, right? So um, looking at sustainability, uh, it's really important to look at the bigger picture. And we don't want to ignore the waste, but when you look at LCAs, life cycle analysis studies, um, it really highlights energy as a big benefit of single use, for example. And uh, we're happy to share resources with the audience um, to go look yourself, because there's a lot of good papers written on the on the topic. Back to you. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Brada. Uh, good stuff. So let's see, up next, let's see. So someone's asking, uh, what are you thinking about servicing um, that you can consider a product single use, but we can take and regenerate the used consumables for repeated use? Uh, what is the regulatory and quality requirements there? And Adam, I think that one's for you. Okay, uh, good question, hard question. Uh, a question we can't go into deeply here enough because it's uh, it's pretty, uh, has many parts to it. Uh, over the years, uh, both of my time here at Thermo Fisher and previously at Genentech and, and Amgen, we've we've all as industry looked at those challenges. Um, and so I'd answer it like this. It's really, it's, let's say it's a part of our reuse. So it wouldn't be single use if, re, if you reuse it, right? I mean, literally using the expression single use, it wouldn't be single use if, re, if you re, reuse it. However, could you rebatch buffers on top of buffers in a single use um, hold bag or mixer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and or medias, it may be a little bit more risky with your filtration, bioburden reduction and qualification of the filters. So I do think it's possible and I do know that some groups and some teams are doing that in industry. Uh, and that's really behooved on the, the end user to do the validation of qualification of that. When you start talking about extractable leachables, particularly downstream, and you start talking about reuse of single use, it becomes even a little bit uh, trickier, especially when you start talking about surface area of the bags and uh, what migration and qualifications going on. And, you know, is it the first use or the third use of using the single use technology? So again, um, I think it really falls to the expertise of the end user and how they want to qualify the materials for, for reuse. Uh, I'll kind of leave it there. I don't want to really talk about the circularity. We could talk about that in another, another context with some of these questions I see uh, lining up here. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Adam. I think that covers it. Um, Adam, I'll stick with you as well. I, I think you covered this a little bit in the presentation. Maybe we can just uh, talk about it again. Um, Clarence is asking, are there any benefits to cost saving sustainability comparing the DynaDrive system to the high performer single use bioreactor models? Absolutely, yes. And so let me just speak to a couple of them. Um, high performance, great product, excellent product. And it's, it's in many of the processes. Uh, Recently, a couple of sites have been at for some installations are still using high performance and installing them at rapid rate. It's nothing wrong with those products. They're great tried and true products. The Dyna drives, however, uh, have a, a more capable turndown ratio, so you can use them over a wider range. And when you start looking, and we have publications, you can get those from our product managers, uh, reach out to any of your FES or TSS sales reps, they absolutely can get you these publications, which go over really um, some of those capabilities and opportunities of using the DynaDrive versus the high performance. Uh, specifically, there's some steps that you can compress in the early expansion stages where uh, you don't necessarily, depending on your process, need to use uh, shaker spinners or waves. And if you remove those steps and go into the high turndown ratios of our smaller uh, Dyna drives, then you can save um, some significant GMP processing time, uh, including the utilities, the plastic waste uh, that we normally would use within those processes. So it's um, 
uh, it's a it's an awesome system. It's a cool system, and uh, we can get into more of those details in some of the publications if you request those. Glad to support that. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Adam. And yeah, if anyone's looking for any more information, again, you can reach out to any of us. Um, contact information is on the screen. So next up, um, let's see. Let me sort through this question. So they're asking. Uh, does Thermo Fisher use uh, the weed rating system to evaluate sustainability, or is there an internal rating system for the facilities? And uh, I guess this is a, a, a overarching question at the end. Practically, is it possible for renewable sources of energy uh, to be able to fulfill the energy requirements? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, we do have some LEED certified facilities, but um, LEED is really not aligned with our current uh, net zero goal. It doesn't go far enough. So uh, we don't have a certification system per se, but our overarching goal is to move away from fossil fuels and electrify our, our facilities. So that's what we're tracking really closely to right now. And yes, once we can convert a facility to renewable electricity, that makes a big difference in our own carbon footprint and achieving our goals. Okay, great stuff. Thanks, Marietta. Um, let's see, next question. So with current market pressure on price reduction, uh, what room is there left to offer sustainable solutions, which are very often not extremely cost effective, like biosource polymer versus petroleum derivative uh, or things like that. Yeah, yeah, and I see the recycling services comment uh, in the et cetera oh, there yeah. too. So this this is a great, great question and it's uh, it's not easy to answer, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So um, what we see in terms of price is yes, uh, often sustainability is a little bit more expensive to get started on as the availability increases, that price is driven down. So uh, getting some early adopters in place. Also um, distance, for example, for re recycling services, um, if you're able to take advantage of companies closer to you, that makes it a little bit more affordable. Uh, and there's lots of very exciting technology going on right now to um, make this more affordable. For example, there's companies working on solutions that will work with your current uh, waste disposal system in your local municipalities, for example, especially in, in the US is where I'm most familiar with that. Uh, and in terms of sourcing the polymers, um, uh, uh, biosource versus petroleum, a lot of companies, including Thermo Fisher, starting to look at that. And um, you know, a big a big challenge for us there is to assure supply, right? We can't really switch until we have assurance of supply. But as more and more companies are seeking that supply, the supply is increasing, and uh, prices do come down. But we also see a little bit of appetite to pay a little bit more uh, from companies. So those early adopters will hopefully take us into a more uh, cost-effective market. So hopefully that answered uh, at least part of your question. Yeah, I think that's great, Moretta. Good stuff. Um, let's see. So th I see this question that right here pretty regularly on webinars about sustainability. Um, and what they're asking is, uh, what are some of the, the fastest things that you could do to improve sustainability in your process? Uh, you know, the quickest way to see results. Uh, what can I do to have the fastest impact, quickest results to show progress on sustainability? I can take that. I can start. And then I, I definitely would like Moretta to chime in here. But from a process standpoint, you're know, looking at your bill of materials, understanding what your bill of materials are. You know, I understand that uh, many of our end users have, have Thermo Fisher and a lot of competitors in the process. So we're working diligently across many work streams. And we went over that earlier with you within the BPSA, ISPE, and other organizations like BPOG to understand what some of the standardization materials can be, they may not be, and really understanding for your new tech transfers and your existing materials of construction um, of those materials working with us and others, uh, what percent of those would be recyclable? And as we further develop an industry and mature those capabilities to pull these materials into a recyclable solution, um, and I do want to talk about, you know, what's, what's the definition of circular in just a second. So we'll talk about that. I see the question here. How are you, how are you setting your standards up so you understand 
you know, am I using silicone or am I using C-Flex? Uh, they're not equally recyclable. We're finding uh, from some recyclers uh, that C-Flex is a little bit more capable within the recycling process and, and uh, silicone is not. However, silicone is widely used, especially in downstream applications. So, so figuring out what's your plan of attack for standardization, we have a 2K playbook that we basically employ to help folks with some of those decision makings for standards and recyclables. Uh, we're glad to go over that as well. So maybe Mareta, do you wanna take the second half of that, that question yeah. there? Happy to do that. So sustainability is a big word and honing in on environmental sustainability, what we like to think of it is sort of the carbon footprint reduction climate piece of that, which if you can invest in renewable energy, so you know, a fast way to do that is look to see what's available from your local utility company. Also looking at your waste, you know, in this cost affecting effective environment we're in right now, um, we've, um, you, you notice in our presentation, we have a waste goal around zero waste, certifying sites for zero waste. So yeah, getting to zero waste may take some time, but often you can, once you look at what waste you're generating, sometimes you find good opportunities to actually eliminate the waste in the first place or increase your recycling very quickly. So those are two ways I would say uh, from a overall environmental sustainability um, program that you can make some quick progress. Also, if your water, um, operations is water intensive, um, engaging your utilities for a water off audit. I know in the US, sometimes those can be secured for free by working with your utilities. So looking at really what resources are you using and how can you switch them to something more sustainable is, is a good way to get started. Awesome, thanks Miranda, thanks Adam. So Adam, following up on what you talked about, like you said, we do have a question in here. They're asking, uh, do you see the materials being truly circular? Uh, plastic to plastic use in the biotech process? And if so, could you talk about how and what examples? Sure. So folks who know me and have been uh, lecturing on single use now for years, know I can be a bit sarcastic with things and I will be with this. So I don't, I don't see them being circular. So in the true nature of where we actually use the example of a Coke can from aluminum, consumed, thrown away, and then made back in a Coke can. I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. In fact, I see huge challenges with trying to do that and getting the C of A's and specifications right back for the customer, depending what applications you use points are, the criticality of those. Very critical single use applications are for medicines, uh, vaccines, et cetera. Um, so I would say, no, I don't see it truly circular. However, that doesn't mean that they can't be uh, consumed in a more um, reliable fashion um, that benefits the environment, the consumer and the vendor. And so we are looking at some of those options and we're looking at, you know, how could they go into, you know, fillers for, again, perhaps asphalt streets or some universities looking at that now, uh, both um, in North America and South America for uh, infrastructure improvements. We have had some very successful ongoing programs with taking single use technologies and making them into both pallets and or um, um, improved woods that last, you know, 10 times as long as standard lumber. Uh, so those are the areas where I see some opportunities, not necessarily bioprocess container, going back to bioprocess container. So um, that's, that's my answer for that. Yeah, I All can right. add a couple that's of a, thoughts there, oh yeah, Adam, on. too. Just uh, so maybe not with the bioprocessing containers because they're multi-layered plastic and they're product touching, but some of the packaging materials can approach circularity. And I know a lot of you use pipette tips, for example. So there are companies now that are taking those boxes back and turning them into new boxes, right? So some of the packaging components um, is where we're going to start. And I may be more optimistic than, than uh, Adam. I think we're going to get to circularity, but yes, it's not going to be anytime soon, but it's a very worthy goal. So with that, back to you, Miles. And, and, and I'll add another thing there. So we'll use the rest of the time for this discussion. <laughs> yeah, go <laughs> ahead, guys, take your time. So again, and I, I completely agree with Moretta, by the way. 
in, in the case where I'm talking about is product contact surfaces that have criticality to them. Um, but yeah, packaging, outer wrapping, we're starting to see some movement there, both with us and, and our competitors. Um, and those are the materials, and they do generate a lot of waste, so we should be going after those, or, and we shouldn't ignore those. Um, there's also secondary containment, poly, uh, high density polyethylene containers, drums, dollies, those type of materials for sure, absolutely circularity. But I think in general, when I'm referring to is the actual uh, single use component has a liquid contact layer and I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. All right, I'll give it a pause there just in case anyone had more to add. Um, thanks guys. So. I think with that, we're gonna wrap up here. Um, audience members, uh, we've got a lot of great questions. There's a few that are really specific here that we are gonna save uh, and take offline. If you do have another question for our speakers right now though, definitely ask it. I'm gonna pass these questions along to Adam and Moretta. So get it in now. If not, again, contact information is on the side as well. So again, audience members, thank you for joining us today. Adam, Moretta, this was a great presentation, a great discussion, and I always love hearing about uh, about sustainability in these presentations and what everyone's doing. So we appreciate you being here. And so with that, everyone, have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. See you.